So it's a great, great pleasure to, uh, to have Mattia Cafasso back uh, virtually at the uh, CRM seminar. So uh, he's an old good friend. Uh, we've been uh, working together all this. Uh, he was uh, uh, at some point, when was it? I, I was trying to remember 2009 that you came. Uh, uh, yeah, spent, eight and nine, 2008 or 2009. Eight no, and nine, you spent nine uh, yes. two years of uh, good postdoc years in here. And uh, since then, now you are uh, uh, in France. And uh, so, um, uh, I'll let you start without uh, any further uh, uh, yeah, just uh, taking the time. So please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Ferenc. Thank you to Ferenc and John for inviting me. And thank you, Guillermo, for the organization. And so today I will speak about some relations between uh, uh, Widom constants and tau functions. The title of the talk is taken from an article that I wrote with um, Pasha Gavrienko and uh, Oleg Dizovi. But in reality, what I want to do is to speak a little bit uh, about um, not just that article, but also other results that I obtained during the years. And basically, I want to speak about results that I obtained with uh, Chao Zhong Vu. Then with the young and Dukas de Villeneuve, who was my PhD student, and then uh, Pasha Gavrienko on the diesel. So the plan of the talk is the following. I will start uh, recalling what are the origins of this object that I will speak about, which is the Widom constant. And the origins are in the study of the asymptotics of block turbulence determinants. This will be a the first part, just a brief uh, recalling. And then I will uh, explain how one can give a sort of combinatorial expansion of uh, the Widom constant and how this uh, combinatorial expansion is related to Sato Siga Wilson Grassmannia and how uh, choosing in a special way uh, your Widom constant, you can identify this object with. Uh, um, Tau functions in the sense of Siga Wilson. So this is the first part of the story. And then there's the second one, which is the one that I developed with uh, Pasha Gavrienko and Olde Gizovi, which is a connection between isomonotomic tau functions, so another kind of tau functions, and again, with them constants. So this will be the main part of the seminar. If I have time, I want also to speak a little bit about uh, connections with uh, determinantal point process, because it's something interesting and there is some results that are curious and worth uh, recalling. So as I told you before, <clears throat> this Widom constant is related to the asymptotics of block turbulence determinant. And I felt that it was reasonable to recall what is the story in the case of scalar topic determinants. So uh, let's suppose that we have a certain function j from S1 to C. And then we denote with uh, jk the Fourier coefficients of uh, uh, this function. And using this Fourier coefficient, we construct a certain uh, finite size determinants that we denote with dn j. These are n by n. Uh, determinants and are given by the determinant of turbulence matrices, which are uh, matrices which are constants along the diagonals. So the entries of the matrix we are computing the determinant are J L minus M. So on the main diagonal, you have J zero, and then on the upper diagonal, you have J minus one, J minus two, and so on. And going down, you have J one, J two, and so on. And there is this very famous theorem by Zego in 1915 that says that under central hypothesis that I will specify in the matrix case, the limit of two consecutive uh, uh, turpice determinants, for, so the limit for n going to infinity of dnj divided by dn minus 1j is equal to a certain uh, constant, uh, which usually is called gj which is given by the exponential of um, 
the zero Fourier coefficient of the log of j. Of course, I mean, you have to be able to take the log of j. You have, I mean, this has to make sense, but putting a um, good hypothesis on j, of course, uh, this can be done. And you have this first result, which is the first uh, Zago limit theorem, which gives, in a way, the um, uh, leading asymptotics of Turpin's determinants when the size goes to infinity. And then, as usual in uh, asymptotics, there is a result which is much harder, which is the one uh, concerning the um, constant terms in the asymptotics. And this is the content of the second, uh, the second uh, Ziegel limit theorem. It's also called sometimes the strong Ziegel limit theorem, which says that if you take d and j and you divide by uh, the constant we introduced before, gj power n, then you have that under certain hypothesis, um, this, uh, this limit exists, is equal to zj, or this definition of the Widom constant in the scalar case. And this is completely explicit in the sense that this is the exponential of a certain sum that is constructed using the Fourier coefficients of uh, j. So for instance, this theorem holds when j of z is equal to the exponential of phi of z, and phi of z is continuous and sufficiently smooth. And uh, these kind of theorems are a nice examples of uh, result in pure mathematics that are motivated actually by physics. There is this very, very nice review by Dyeftitz and Kazowski of 2014, in which they, they argue and they explain how this result and many others were mainly motivated, at least at the beginning, by the application to the two-dimensional Bizim model. It's a very nice review. You have a lot of results. And you see this nice interaction between physics and uh, mathematics. So um, these are the results that we have in the scalar case. But then you have um, another interesting question that is relevant also this one in application, which is what does it happen if instead of considering J a scalar function, you consider a matrix valued function. So now big J, capital J, is a function from S1 to the group of invertible matrices of uh, size n by n. You take as JK as before the Fourier coefficients of J and you construct dnj. Now this dnj is the determinant of a block matrix in which um, you have elements that now are periodics on the diagonal, in the sense that you have um, constant block diagonals. So you have this element j, k, which, is, which are n by n matrices. And of course, also in this case, you can ask a very natural question, which is, what is the limit for a small n going to infinity of the n j? So this is a much uh, harder question. And uh, we will see that in this case, uh, the answer is not completely explicit as in the scalar case. And it's worth mentioning that also in this case, you have applications, for instance, in uh, quantum spin chains. So um, as I said before, you have some results that are uh, less um, explicit in this case. And the reason is that now this Zego, this Widom constant that we will have to introduce in the matrix case is it becomes a freedom determinant. So since it's a freedom determinant, I have to introduce some notation to speak about uh, by the spaces where we are working with. And so we will denote with H the space of L2 function, which are vector valued. So L2 function from S1 to Cn. And uh, we take the natural polarization of H. So namely, we divide it, we split it in H plus and H minus, where even if I didn't write it, in H plus, I put the function with, which have uh, 
negative, zero negative Fourier modes. So the only Fourier coefficients that are significant here are the one with index positive or equal to zero. And H minus are the one with uh, negative Fourier modes. We denote with pi plus minus the projection on H plus and H minus. And we need also the uh, inversion operator that here I denote with Yota that sends H plus to H minus and vice versa. And the explicit uh, uh, form of Yota, of course, is this one. Yota V of Z is equal to Z minus one multiplied by V of Z minus one. And once we have uh, this notation, we can define Turpitz and the Henkel operator. Actually, I should have written here Henkel and Turpitz operator associated to the symbol J, which are given by this expression. So for instance, if we take HJ, this is what? Uh, this is an automorphism of H plus. You take a function, you apply Yota, then you multiply it by J and you project back to uh, H plus. You do something similar for H tilde and for T of J, which is uh, the Turpitz uh, operator, you do something which is simpler. Simply you multiply your function by J and then you project into um, P plus. So these are the definition. They look quite arbitrary. What is nice is that if you take the standard um, uh, basis of H, of H plus, actually, you can verify that um, this um, operator are represented by infinite matrices that are given by infinite version of Henkel matrices for the first two and an infinite version of a topist matrix. Okay, so these are the, the expression. On HJ, you just have the positive Fourier modes of J. On H tilde J, you just have the negative ones. And on the Turpitz uh, operator, you have both positive and negative. And uh, once you have uh, defined this um, automorphism, now I can state the Wheaton theorem, which says uh, the following. So this is a theorem that appeared in 1962. It's due to Wheaton. And it says the following, suppose that you have a certain function that we call the symbol of the Turpitz matrix J from S1 to JLN. And suppose that it satisfies some analytic condition, which are stated here. And uh, then you have that under this analytic analytical condition, you have that the limit for small n going to infinity of dnj divided by gj power n, it exists. We call it ZJ. So this object will be the Widom constant we are speaking about. And this is given by a freedom determinant. It's given by the freedom determinant of an operator, which is the composition of the Turpitz operator associated to G minus and the, op the Turpitz operator associated to uh, G. And I forgot to say who is GJ in this case. Well, it's a natural matrix generalization of the GJ I defined before. So basically you take the same expression as before, but you have to take a determinant because now J is, is a matrix. Okay. So you have this um, very relevant uh, difference, which is that now this object, this ZJ is not um, explicit anymore, but it's a thread of the term. And actually manipulating uh, this expression tj minus one times tj, you can prove that this operator is equal to the identity minus uh, the product of two Hanker determinant. And thanks to this condition here, well, this condition exactly gives you the fact that this operator is identity minus uh, a product of two Hilbert-Schmidt operator. So this is identity minus a trace class operator, which means that the thread of determinant of this operator is well defined. Okay. So this is the main character of my talk is this ZJ. I will not speak anymore about asymptotics of block Turpitz determinants, 
but what is relevant for me now is this uh, ZJ. Okay. Are there any questions before I go on? Okay. I was just stopping because this is the definition of the main uh, character and I wanted it to be, to be clear, but I guess that you already saw it many times. And now what can we do with this, um, with this Widom constant? So uh, the first thing that we want to do is to relate this um, Widom constant to the Birkhoff factorization of uh, the symbol. So now we have this uh, J from S1 to JLNC. Uh, we have our Widom constant defined as the freedom determinant. And we want to relate this Widom constant to two different Riemann Hilbert problem of, or if you want, to um, biblical factorization of the symbol. So the two Riemann Hilbert problem that we uh, want to study are the following. The first one is, is written in this way. So it's, um, the problem is finding a certain uh, matrix valued function psi, which is analytic everywhere in the Riemann sphere, but on the unit circle. And in such a way that you have this continuity uh, on the unit circle, which is given by C minus minus one Z times C plus Z. And in order to have unicity, uh, you impose a certain asymptotic condition for psi minus at infinity. You impose that psi minus is equal to the identity plus um, lower order choice. So I forgot if I thought that or not, but uh, so of course, what does this mean, this riemann hilbert problem? It means that phi plus is defined inside the unit disk and phi minus is defined um, outside the unit disk. So this is what we will call uh, the direct riemann hilbert problem. And then we want also to study what I will call the dual riemann hilbert problems, which is similar, but in the expression of the jumps, the jumps well, went on the other side. Of course, uh, this makes sense because J is a matrix, okay? So these things that we have a direct and a dual riemann hilbert problems is due to the fact that J is a matrix valued function. And there is a proposition that we will not use immediately, but nevertheless is kind of important and gives you a, a flavor of what uh, this uh, ZJ is. Uh, um, you can prove that the direct human hybrid problem is solvable if uh, um, and only if uh, you have uh, that uh, P plus J, so the Turpice determinant associated that J is invertible, and that the dual Riemann Hilbert problem is solvable if and only if P plus J minus one, as operator acting on H plus, is invertible. And moreover, if the direct and dual Riemann Hilbert problem are solvable, they give you an explicit expression for the inverse of these two operators. So, in a way, well, I speak for experts in tau functions. This suggests already that this ZJ should be related to some tau function, right? Because you have that uh, when some riemann hilbert problems are not solvable, this, this ZJ becomes zero. So this already suggests that this should be related to some tau functions. So what we will do for this uh, section on tau function as widom constant is that we will consider a riemann hilbert problem the direct riemann hilbert problem as given. So we imagine that J is already given as a factorized symbols in terms of phi plus and phi minus. And phi bar plus and phi bar minus, they will be something that we have to find. This is, let's say the idea here now. And um, as I said, we consider so the direct riemann hilbert problem as given. And now we define two more operators, A and D, that are different from the uh, Turpice and Henkel uh, operators that we defined before, because this A and D, they goes from H minus to H plus, and from H plus 
to H minus. Here you have the abstract expression in terms of projection and multiplication operators. And um, you can write them as integral operators on S1 with these uh, two kernels that I've written here. And that I think that at least to Ferenc, they will sound familiar because well, they're related to some, some work that I will quote afterwards. In any case, um, what is important here is that um, this is, let's say, the first step of a result with uh, uh, Oleg Lizovi and Pasha Gavrienko. What uh, you can prove is that um, the Widom constant that we defined before actually is also equal to the determinant on the whole space H, not H plus, on the whole space H of a certain operator, which is the identity plus L, in which L is written in um, uh, block version in this way. So we put zero and zero on the main uh, diagonal and we put A and D uh, on the off diagonal terms. And the splitting is related to the splitting of H in H plus and H minus. And you have a two lines proof that tells you that the determinant of uh, this operator here is equal to the Willem constant. So basically you have this determinant on H of identity plus L. You multiply on one side by identity minus A identity, and you immediately obtain that this determinant on H is equal to the determinant on H plus of identity minus AD. And then you use the explicit expression of A and D. So this, this, this line. And what else? And then instead of this P minus, you, you write identity minus P plus to do this kind of manipulation. And uh, you arrive at the, at the end, you arrive at the precise expression that I gave you before for the Widom constant. Before I was writing, tj minus one tj, here I'm writing the determinant of h plus j minus one p plus j is the same thing, okay? So with this uh, very neat and very simple proposition, we relate uh, this Widom constant to um, a certain freedom determinant on the whole space uh, h. And the reason why uh, we want to do it is because now we will give a combinatorial expression of this determinant, which is here. How do we do it? We do it as follows. So um, first of all, this is just cosmetic, okay? It's not necessary, but sometimes it's useful in notation. We introduce this Z prime, which is the set of half integer. So we take Z and we shift off one half. And, um, and then we think about uh, this um, operator identity plus L as an infinite uh, uh, matrix, which is indexed by uh, Z primes times N. Why Z prime times N? Well, with Z primes, uh, we indicate uh, the entries of uh, the operators A and D in Fourier modes. But then uh, A and D, they are themselves n by n matrices. Okay. So our convention is that, well, um, we index lines and columns of these um, operators as uh, half integers plus elements uh, from one to n, integers from one to n. And of course, there is this uh, nice um, von Koch formula that tells you that um, when you have the determinant of an object, which is identity plus a matrices, either this is a infinite case or either this is a freedom determinant or even finite size case, you can, um, you can express it as the sum of all the principal minus associated to L. So you have the determinant of identity plus L and you write it as the sum of all the principal minus associated to L. 
So this is the general formula it does have doesn't have anything to do with the particular form of L that we have. But actually, when we apply it um, to our specific uh, instance, our specific examples, we have the, the following. You have that the only minors that gives you something which is non-zero are the minors in which you take the same number of positive and negative uh, lines or columns in your principal minors. Okay. So basically, um, all the terms which are non zero and this sum, they are indexed by object of these types, in which the pi here are half positive integers. P here stands for particles. The H, I are um, a negative half integers. So this stays for ors. And then you have colors, OK? Because this PI and this AJ gives you the position of the block matrix. But then inside the block, you want to indicate some, uh, um, some specific line. And so you need the color, OK? So um, the minus are indexed by object of this type. You have k positive of integers, k negative of integers, and to have we have integers, you have associated a color. Okay. And of course, you can think in the standard way um, due to the Japanese school, you can think about this bunch of data. Um, in terms of Maya diagrams, with this uh, difference with respect to the usual setting that you have in KP, which is that now you don't have just one uh, Maya diagrams, but you have uh, as many dia uh, Maya diagrams as colors. Okay, and here there is a specific examples that we have in which we have three colors, and we have the usual correspondence between uh, Maya diagrams and uh, young diagrams. Okay. Of course, uh, let's say these things of putting colors is more related to uh, conformal blocks. Usually you, you don't do it in uh, KP theory. Okay. But since, well, this, uh, this article that we wrote with uh, Pasha and Oleg was really this effort to relate uh, tau functions uh, with conformal blocks, where we adopt this. Uh, um, we adopt this convention and we use colors for our uh, Maya and Young diagrams. Okay. And, and then we have this uh, theorem that we proved with Pasha and Oleg, which says the, the following consider a certain symbol J and suppose that is already given in a factorized form. As the product of c minus minus one times c plus, uh, and then uh, you you can prove using this uh, combinatorial expansion that I tried briefly to uh, show you before. You can prove that the associated tau function, because this is how we define the tau function, so the associated Widom constant admits this combinatorial expansion z j in terms of uh, product in terms of sum of some product of ZM plus ZM minus, where I denoted with ZM plus and ZM minus just the uh, minus of the um, infinite matrix representation of A and D. Okay, so I will recall you how it works. You have J, J is factorized with C minus and C plus. With C minus and C plus, you construct two operators, which are called here A and D. And the tau function is just a, an infinite sum of product of minus associated to A and D. And you have, uh, well, and you have here this minus one 
times the size of P, well, this is just due to the fact that you have this position of A and D. So you have to put these lines. So this is the first result that we had in that paper. This Sego Widon constant that uh, was known since the 60s, well, it has this um, nice combinatorial expansion that is really present in, uh, in the research. For instance, is the same um, expression that you find in this uh, article by Nekrasov and Okunkov on saber witten theorem and random partitions. Of course, this is related to, to random partition. And I hope to show you afterward what is the relation with uh, integral probability. So um, you can also give a cross manual interpretation of this combinatorial expansion in this way. So now we consider two uh, subspaces on uh, H, which uh, we construct in this way. We construct uh, V plus as the span of the elements. Uh, sorry, Mattia. Yeah, tell Mattia, me, John. could I make a, a quick comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, if you go back, just, just go back one transparency. Yeah. This one? Yeah, just go back to the previous one. Oh, okay. The previous one. This one. Well, I see the same one. Ah, uh, uh, sorry. Can you go back one? Uh, okay. Yeah, but so, now I'm... Uh, yeah, not two, just one. Okay, this one. You do. Yeah, yeah, now it will no, arrive, no. I guess. Uh, you just have to wait, I think. <laughs> well, the next one. Okay, stop. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the Z, Z M plus is a yes. determinant also, yes. uh, but it's an infinite determinant. And the, the uh, APM or APH or DHP are finite determinants, right? Yes, yes. Both of, so ZJ, this is a freedom determinant. The one on the left is a freedom determinant. Yeah. The ones on the right, right. they are finite size determinant. Okay, and so this equality between the determinant which gives Z and the determinant which gives A is the Jambelli identity if you interpret it in terms of Grassmannians. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would, yeah. Now I think that in the next slide you you see it even more clearly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so indeed, okay. because um, indeed these subspaces that I denoted with D plus, W plus and W minus, these are two subspaces that I directly define in terms of affine coordinates in the sense that I define W plus as the span of Z K minus one half plus, plus sorry, plus A applied to Z power k minus one half and k is negative. And I recall you that a goes from h minus to h plus. So this space uh, w plus, uh, oh. I'm sorry. So this is isomorphic uh, via the projection via, um, via p minus to h minus. And then you have another one. Okay, just one, one, last, one last point on that. Yeah. Um, the way you have written it with W plus and W. Now, you, you haven't mentioned Grassmannians, but obviously a Grassmannian no. is behind this. Yeah. But, so the way you have written it, am I correct in saying that because you have the graph of a map from H plus to H minus, therefore you are in the big cell of the Grassmannian? Exactly. F thank you, John, for pointing that out. Yes. Uh, and we, we will just see big cell in this talk. So all these results that I will speak about, they are just related to big cell. To be honest, I don't know how to, to put inside also the remaining part, the remaining part of the Grassmannian, but you are absolutely true. Indeed, these are affine coordinates and we can use affine coordinates because we are in the big cell. But that's true, yes, we are in the big cell. Definitely.
And once you define this W plus and W minus, thanks to the Jambel identity, you have that um, the expansion that I defined before. So this tau function in a natural way is uh, an expansion in Pluca coordinates for the subspaces W plus and W minus. Okay. And indeed. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I have yet another question. This is another delicate question because, um, so uh, again, you have not really yet specified the Grassmannian, but it's obviously lurking there. I, I However, will not actually, I, uh, I will not define. Uh, okay. But still, uh, <laughs> it is in the, it is, it is there on stage anyway. Of course. Of course, so, uh, yeah. And what I'd like to ask is the following. When you call it Plicker coordinates, well, the Plicker mapping maps the Grassmannian into the ex projectivized exterior space, right? But what you have is a mapping into a multi-component fermionic Clifford box space. Yeah, yeah. Right, it's a multi-component one. And so, I'd like to understand in what sense the coefficients are Plicker coordinates. Plicker coordinates are labeled by partitions, but your coordinates are labeled by, uh, so to speak, multi partitions because of the multi component list. So are you really speaking about a flag manifold rather than a grass manifold? Or what is the, what is no, the no, uh, no, actual no. It, explanation? It's still a grass manifold. And the point is that, uh, of course, when you have this, so what sits behind this stuff is the isomorphism between the uh, grass manifold you construct with uh, uh, vector valued function and the grass manifold you construct to scalar functions. It's, it's yeah. just that. So basically what I'm doing is just that um, I'm block diagonalizing uh, the frame associated to W plus and W minus. And so for me, the block uh, matrix value that find coordinates are just the blocks of uh, the frame once I diagonalize it. So it's really down to heart for, for me, it's just, I have a block uh, frame and I diagonalize it pretty much in the same way as in the paper by uh, Ferenc and D. But it's really okay. a gas I, money. I, think I, 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 be getting I, I more... used to say that it's a flag manifold. It's really a gas money. Okay, no, I believe you, but I just wanted to know how. Um, since you speak about Plicker coordinates and the way we usually identify Plicker coordinates, they are labeled simply by partitions, not by multi partitions or multi Maya yeah. diagrams. Okay, so let but me come back. Yeah. You have this isomorphism between the multi component fermionic. Uh, so I guess that's what I'd like to know. If, if we wrote down these coefficients really as Plicker coordinates, how are they related to these multi? Components. So, so let, let's, for instance, let's uh, look at this uh, bunch of Maya diagrams. We have three Maya diagrams here. What you can do is just to forget about colors and do the following. You put, you put the blue, um, you put the blue Maya diagrams, then you put the red, uh, the, the green one shifted by one. So you interlace them. And then you put the red one, okay? You put, you, you put them together, you join them together. And then you forget about colors and you will have the Maya diagram uh, related to, um, to the usual expansion that you have in Sato's deal. It's just this. Of course, in terms of young diagrams, I didn't think about it, I don't know how to have a clear interpretation in terms of young diagrams. But in terms of Maya diagrams, you simply forget colors. This is what you do. Well, uh, my, my point is that you are really dealing with the same Clifford representation with two different bases. It's, it, as you say, the multi-component fermion uh, Fox space 
is isomorphic to the single component. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Space, because right? look, look, John, here I could have said, here I could have said, just uh, let's choose some uh, lines and columns here. Let's forget about colors. Let's just see which lines and columns we get. And we will have this expansion of minors, and it, this will be the classical one that you have in Sato Steel. So this, these things of color is just a fancy way to keep in mind that you're dealing with matrix valued stuff, but you can forget about it. And I mean, even in this uh, Seagal, in the, yes, even in the Seagal Wilson paper, this is what they do. At a certain point, they, they study some subspaces of the Grassmannian and they see how loop groups act on this Grassmannian. And well, they do the same. And they say, well, but these things we can put in the scalar Grassmannian using a certain isomorphism that I will quote before uh, afterward. Should I? Uh, I think you I can go on. You, you yeah. have uh, 20 minutes, so uh, okay, okay. just to yes. make sure that, that you can finish. Let's yeah. Just, yeah. Um, so I spoke about, I spoke about Grassmannian interpretation, but of course you can ask yourself where, but where are the times here? So um, the integrable hierarchy is you get them in the following way. You choose a subspaces of the integers <coughs> and you choose some, polynomial matrix lambda j um, in such a way that lambda, oh, sorry, lambda i and lambda j here commutes for any i j belonging to e. And then you take a certain x um, belonging to the negative part of SLN, z minus one, and, um, and you consider uh, a certain, certain symbols j of z, which is written in this, in this way. This is C minus minus one. So the exponential of minus X of Z times the exponential of TJ lambda J. So um, if you choose this particular kind of symbols, what you get is that this constant ZJ, it becomes a tau, a real, TF, a real tau function of Sigma Wilson type. So for instance, if you take as lambda one, this particular matrix in which we have one Z in the upper right corner and one uh, a bunch of one in the sub diagonal. And then you take lambda J equal to lambda power J for J um, different from zero modern. Then you have that um, your constant ZJ gives you tau function for the gelfand dickey reduction of KP. In which way, well, using this isomorphism between M2 S1 CN, which is our H, and uh, the scalar version. And the isomorphism is just given by this expression. Okay. So in this way, you recover the classical Sigal Wilson theory, but just for Gelfandic reduction of KP. You don't get your KP in this way. You just get the Fandic reduction. And so just to make an example is for instance, you choose C minus in this way with some strange coefficients that are related to the asymptotic expansion of the IV function. Then you, you can prove that the expansion that I gave you before gives you for log of Z, well, you also have to put this epsilon in order to take account of uh, genus expansion. You have that log of Z, well, actually Z coincide with the witten Konsevich tau function. And another nice example, which is maybe less complicated is the following. Um, if you take as X minus um, a matrix, which is uh, nilpotent. So for instance, you take X in this way, and in this case, for instance, n equal to three, what you get are uh, polynomial solutions of the gelfand dickey hierarchy. So here we have n equal to three. So we have a polynomial solution to the Businek hierarchy, actually a family, okay? Because it depends on the parameters, a1, a2, and a3. And of course, in this way, you can recover a, 
a lot of interesting uh, results about uh, Gelfandiki um, equations. But what is nice here, in my opinion, is that if you take a matrix realization of finite dimensional B algebras, different from SL, SLN, then you have that both these examples, the Witten conservative tau function and the polynomial solution to Gelfandiki equations, generalized to different circle of hierarchies. So in order to be more specific, suppose that you have your favorite uh, G dot uh, finite dimension of simple Lie algebra. You take the katz moody and twisted affine katz moody algebras associated to that, which is a central extension of the dupe algebra. You take the Eisenberg subalgebra of this katz moody one, the principal one, if I remember well, and then you take as symbols this J written in this way. And then you have that for any C minus um, of this type, so the exponential of a certain element in the negative part of the katz moody uh, the algebra, you have that tau, ZJ coincide with the uh, tau function associated to a particular solution of uh, the hierarchy, the Dreamfeld circle of hierarchy, okay, associated to an arbitrary algebra. And uh, during my thesis in, 2000, in yeah, 2008, I did it for the Fandiki hierarchies. And then with Chao Zhong Wu, I generalized it to Dreamfeld circle of hierarchies. And this example of polynomial solution is something that I obtained with my student, uh, Andrew Kessler-Vignerf and Di Young, quite recently in 2017. Okay, this is how much I wanted to say about um, solitonic tau function. I know that I just have 10 minutes, but I will try to be quick and speak also about the isomonotomic part of this talk. So uh, in order to, uh, to introduce the part about isomonotomic stuff, uh, well, the first interesting thing is that, is it right now that we see not just the direct factorization, but also the dual factorization? And there is this uh, a very interesting uh, result, which is already due to Widom in 1974, and then it has been rediscovered by Alexander Hitz, Jean, and Korepin in 2007, which is the following. Suppose that you have um, a smooth family of symbols that depends on an additional parameter t. And suppose that for every given uh, t, you have that j has both direct and dual factorization. Then you can uh, prove that um, the log derivative of Zj is given by a certain expression, which is written here, um, which is an integral over S1 of a certain expression, which is, a, which is the trace of an object which depends both on C plus and C bar minus. And when you see this kind of expression, it's very quick to realize that this formula is quite similar to the one that had been given by Mark in um, 2016, uh, no. When was that, uh, Marco? Well, this formula given by Marco for 2010. This, 2010, yeah, 16, there's nothing to do with it. 2010. So, um, this formula is very similar to the one uh, which defines the so-called Malgrange one form associated to an arbitrary riemann hibbert problem in the case in which you don't have any self-intersection. And for me, this is really this simple result because it's really simple. It's a, it has been rediscovered several times. This simple result is the one that gives you this connection between isomonotomic Tau functions and um, this Zeko Widom constant. In the sense that um, if you have a certain isomodomic system on the Riemann sphere, 
the philosophy is the following. You should proceed as follows. You take the Riemann Hilbert problem associated to your isomorphic system. So maybe it's on some complicated contours. I don't know. It depends on your isomorphic systems. But then the the message is that you should try to reduce your uh, Riemann Hilbert problems to Riemann Hilbert problems on the unit SIP with a certain matrix J. And then up to explicit constants, um, because of this relation between uh, the formula that I showed you before and the Magrange one form, this is in general, I mean, this is a meta theorem. In general, you should be able to relate the ZJ with the Jimbo Miraway and tau function associated to your isomorphic system. So, in order to be more concrete, let's say, for instance, what happens when you consider the case of Panel A6. So, Panel A6 is the equation that results as. Um, the condition of isomorphic deformation of a certain connection with four singular points on the Riemann sphere. So the four singular points here are at zero, one, t, and infinity. And you have this definition of Jimbo Miraweno tau function in terms of traces of uh, the residue matrices associated to the last pair. And um, well, and then you can even write the Panel V6 equation in this fancy way um, using the tau function. So this nice expression in terms of a certain determinant is given by Ichin in 1997. And this theta here, there are some constant entering in the, um, in the asymptotics of the solution phi of the Lux pair. And, um, and the idea, well, this is the classical idea, the idea is that this isomotomic system is associated to a riemann hilbert problems, which is given uh, by, well, by this picture, let's say, in which you have four uh, little disks uh, centered around zero, t, one, and infinity, which are connected by a line. And um, choosing local solution of your last pair around the singular points and joining them with a solution with an external solution, you can translate uh, the problem of finding the, uh, the matrix V satisfying the Lux um, equation in a certain immanuable problem. Okay. Actually, since I put uh, the Lux pair in this form, uh, this um, this riemann hilbert problem that we will have will be expressed in, in the form of a certain dual riemann hilbert problem in the language that I gave you before. And um, the content of uh, the theorem that we had with Oleg and Pasha can be summarized in this, uh, with this drawing. If you want to study the tau function associated to panel A6, what we want to study is the tau function associated to the isomotomic system of a sphere with four singular points. So what you should do is to cut your sphere in two parts. And now on each part, you have just three singular points. When you have three singular points, everything in your isomotomic system can be written explicitly in terms of hypergeometric uh, equation. So these terms here, this Jimbo Miwa Ueno tau function associated to the two um, parts are explicit terms. And then uh, you will have uh, a certain determinant, which is related to the fact that you cut into your uh, Riemann sphere. And this determinant that you have will be a widom constant. So the determinant of something in which we have identity A and D. And these A and D, which are exactly the same that I gave you before, you construct it out of some uh, matrices C plus and C minus that are written explicitly in terms of hypergeometric tau function with uh, singular points at zero to infinity and zero one infinity because you cut in two parts. Okay, this is 
well, this is just a drawing, okay? This is not a real theorem, but uh, skipping many details, uh, the, uh, oh, yeah. um, the, the more precise thing that we do is the following. So you have your Neman Hilbert problems. It's related, yeah. Can I zoom in? You see when I zoom in, right? Yeah. So this Riemann this um, isomotomic system is related to a certain Riemann Hilbert problem as I've written before, in which you have these some matrices which are M0 and infinity M1, which are related to the monotony around singular points. And then what you try to do, the first step is to as in the picture before, is to cut these two Riemann Hilbert problems into. So this you do in the following way. Yeah. Uh, you do it. Sorry. Yes. You do it the following way. You cut an annulus here in the red part. You define a sort of new matrix C hat out of the solution you had before uh, psi tilde. And then you have this Riemann Hilbert problem with different jumps on uh, these contours that are here. But now what's nice in this new uh, drawing is that um, the contours are disconnected. You have the contours around, uh, inside the red part and the contours outside. In each of the contours, you have a free uh, little disk, two at finite size and one at infinite. So this you can solve explicitly in terms of hypergeometric tau function. And this is what you do in uh, the step C, ignoring the other side. And then you have, going back, that finding phi is equivalent to uh, finding a solution of this Neman Hilbert problem, which is a dual Neman Hilbert problem in our language, in which, and this is an interesting part, actually J is completely explicit in terms of hypergeometric tau function. Okay. Well, I went a little bit quick, but this is the idea. What I wanted to point out is that this drawing that I showed you before, which is just a drawing, actually is very concrete. So when you think about it in terms of human Hilbert problems, it's something that you can really do by hand. And I will conclude with the following slide, and I will not speak about determinant point processes be next time. Uh, we, in which we have this more precise formulation of the theorem which is the following. Let's denote with Jimbo Mirawayno tau function of T, the isonotomic tau function associated to this equation. So it's given by this formula. And then you have that this tau function is given by a trivial constant times T power one half some uh, monotomy exponents related to the riemann hilbert problems times Zj. Well, Zj is the Widom constant, but J is uh, written in terms of hypergeometric tau function. So you have this um, very explicit uh, uh, solution of pan v 6 which is actually due to Pasha Gavrienko and Oleg Rizov. This was the original result of Pasha and Oleg about freedom determinant expression of tau functions for pan v 6 and what we did in the paper together is just to realize that actually this nice freedom determinant expression is just another uh, example of widom constant. But of course, now there is a question that I think is interesting to John and maybe also to someone else, which is the following. When you have solution of Pandere 6, we all know here that they are parameterized by a certain monodromy surface. Okay. It is written here. It depends on four parameters that are related to the parameters in the Panevesic equation. Now, with this picture that I gave you 
right now, it's also true that at least the combinatorial expansion of the solution is very explicitly related to uh, Pluke coordinates of two uh, subspaces in a certain gas money. Okay. One is W plus, which is isomorphic to H minus, and one is W minus, which depends on T. Just one of them depends on T, which is isomorphic to H plus. So one thing that in my opinion would be very interesting, but I have no idea how to do it, is to see if there is a geometric way to describe a sort of map between the monodromy surface, which has a lot of structure, for instance, Poisson structure, and these two subspaces, W plus and W minus. This, this wouldn't be an embedding of pan of 6 into KP. It's, it's not that, okay? Because this W minus T, of course, is, does evolve in a strange way with respect to T, okay? Basically, the dynamics is dictated by the hypergeometric equation, okay? <coughs> But still, I am pretty convinced that there should be a way, a sort of explicit uh, uh, map between the monodromy surface and gas panel. And I think that this really would be interesting to, to be studied. Okay, thank you for attention, for your attention, and I, I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> So maybe we have time for uh, two or three questions. And then after, uh, there will be plenty of time to uh, to discuss more uh, precise uh, details. But just maybe uh, let's prioritize the uh, more sort of general question. Uh, Matthew, I have a general question. So when uh, these you have this dual uh, riemann hiba problem, yeah. Um, so you call it dual, right? But usually the dual is reserved for something. So if you have a vector bundle, the dual is the dual. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not that, right? It's, it's no, a different no, thing. no, I wouldn't think, no, 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 I don't think so. Well, on the other hand, there is one thing, well, since I'm among friends, I can see that there is one thing that is, um, Interesting to me, and I admit that I don't fully understand, which is the following. So, of course, you have this uh, Birkhoff Grothendieck theorems that tells you that um, every time that you have a certain function j, and uh, you can factorize it as, well, epsi minus and c plus, and then you have in the middle a diagonal matrix with some mm -hmm. exponents. And of course, the statement is that uh, the, um, the vector bundle uh, related to, to J is trivial if and only if the coefficients of this diagonal matrix are all equal to Z. Now, here, since you have two riemann hibbert problems, I guess that you have two, um, two different vector bundles. Now, I don't quite yes. understand. I don't quite understand what is the relation between the two because, of course, there are examples, and actually, Marco, you showed them to me. There are examples in which you can prove that um, one factorization is uh, is trivial with trivial coefficient, and the other one is not. But what are the two different vector bundles? I mean, how are the two vector bundles associated? So I have no precise idea. At the beginning, I thought that it was like sort of dual, and this is why it came into my mind. But well, how, how, how it comes that one is trivial and the other one is not, I don't quite understand. Right, but well, I think that corresponds uh, to transposition of the J matrix, right? Oh, okay. But still, is it possible that one is trivial and the other one not? In, in yeah, that, that, is terms? that is possible. Yeah, right, of course, they have to, as, as, as there is the example, right? But yeah, yeah. what is it's, the meaning of the transposition now? I don't, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But of course, this is also, so I forgot to say that, but also in geometrical terms, this is an also 
another good reason to call the Widom constant tau functions, right? Because yeah. they, they tell you that some, some vector bundles are trivial. They tell you that two vector bundles are not trivial. The two of them, exactly, yeah. the two of them. The two yeah. of them. All right. Other questions? I don't so know I if John is, probably yeah, John is uh, not. Uh... At, uh, at some point, um, you, you mentioned uh, that if you take um, some different matrix uh, realization of different uh, Algebras, you get uh, Greenfield Sokolov. So that does this uh, uh, relate? Uh, can you uh, express this as a specific condition on the jump or on the symbol instead of uh, just on the matrix? Uh, uh, what was it, lambda? Uh, well, yes, because for instance, if you take the D case, say D four, mm -hmm. this means that you take as jump the exponential of elements in the algebra of special orthogonal matrices. So this means that the, the jump is related to the group. But the jump will, will also have some dependence on Z. Will that enter into the condition on the jump or uh, will it just be? Constant? Dependence on, on Z? On, well, the, the jump is an element of the loop group, not just of the group. Yes. So is the loop group of orthogonal matrices, mm. for instance. Yeah. And what is interesting? Well, what is interesting? I mean, um, for instance, you have generalization of um, the Witten Conservative tau function, what Dubrovin used to call topological tau function. And what we verified with Chao Zhong Wu is that, well, using this combinatorial expansion, you, exa you, you, you recover them. In, in a way which is, from an algorithm point of view, is quite it's quite good because you can you can go quite far actually. I mean, when we did it, we verified some examples that were in the literature, and you can go quite far uh, with with the computational coefficients. Very good. So maybe this is a good point to uh, to. Uh end here the general discussion so let's thank uh, Matti again thank you and uh, we can stick around a little bit and discuss uh, more specific questions if there is any okay thank you very much thank you <laughs>